Hello and welcome to the Workshop Banter Podcast, Episode 2. I'm Matt. And I'm Keith. And in this episode, we'll be talking about getting started as a maker, covering things like projects, workspace, tools, and learning new skills. We hope you enjoy the podcast. So what have you been up to, Matt? So I'm working on a commission for something for Christmas. Someone who bought a mud kitchen off me a couple of years ago wants a wooden sleigh. And the I've never seen this concept before, but it's a sleigh to go next to a Christmas tree and you put your Christmas presents in it. So it's quite a cute idea. That sounds cool. Can it also be used as a sleigh? Um, no, because I'm carving it out of some scaffold board so the runner's wouldn't be i think it'd all snap off and fall apart so i will have to put a disclaimer on it that uh, otherwise some maimed child will sue me purely decorative purely decorative what are you working on now i've just finished my pergola build which i'm glad to see the back of and i'm contemplating i've got some sand and cement left over from doing my patio and i'm and I've wanted to buy a bird bath for quite a while. And now I'm starting to think, could I make a bird bath by perhaps forming some wooden moulds, setting some concrete inside? The only bit I'm unsure how to do at the moment is the bowl part that holds the water. Obviously, I could turn something on the lathe and use that as a mould to, to form the concrete. But I don't really want to waste the wood on that, if you know what I mean. So trying to think of other ways to do it any bright ideas well i've seen modern builds do some really simple things like using a plastic bucket or even um one of those cheap beach balls you get like that concurve convex concave concave shape if you used a beach ball or something like that um yeah i don't know anything plastic's good because it's flexible and you can pop it out easily that's a clever idea and i guess you could rub it in vaseline or whatever so that it doesn't stick to it yeah i guess so failing that i might just go around some charity shops and try and find some big fruit bowls or something (laughs) yeah that'd be perfect i had an angle grinder disc explode on me while i was working on the pergola which was quite scary I saw because Instagram's full of those pictures of the, the guy with the, is it the face shield or the goggles and it halfway f- terrifying. Yeah. But yeah, it, it didn't go anywhere near you though, I take it. It didn't. And um, the, the really odd thing about it was that I wasn't actually cutting anything when it happened. I'd literally just started it up and it just went pew, and a piece of it just flew sort of towards my feet, but didn't hit my foot, which I was happy about. Um, yeah, it's quite scary. I, I, I mean, I'd, I'd always heard you need to check your angle grinder discs really carefully for a best before date and any damage to the blade, which makes sense. And I do do that. But I think the, the bunch of cutting discs that I have at the moment will be the last cheap ones that I ever buy, put it that way. Yes. Yeah, I guess so. I've had a few, I had a, like a fake Dremel and it had the little tiny, I don't know what they are, three or four centimeter ones and they'd break all the time. And I just stopped using them. And you've got no blade guard on that. At least with yeah. a proper grinder, you can have the guard around so it deflects it away from you. That's true. And even though they're really tiny, they could still do some real damage if one was flying towards your eyes. And I think probably people, when they're doing little hobby things, are less likely to wear goggles. That's very true. About your angle grinder thing, did you see Stumpy Nub's video about the chainsaw angle grinder ones? I did. Yeah, I, I've never had one, and I never will now after that. Yeah, the amount of damage that did to his hand was, was terrifying. And to such a seasoned woodworker as well. Yeah, definitely. If he can get hurt, anyone can. So in the last episode, we talked a little bit about our backgrounds and how we got started making things. Um, and in this one, Matt, you had the idea of talking about ideas for other people getting started making things i guess yeah i think it's a question i get asked a lot is what was the first tool you got or how did you start or just how did you get into it so i thought we could go through some bits and uh discuss how each of us um started with that and it might be helpful for some other people so let's talk about some good beginner projects to get started with um i think my suggestion would be a bird box um mainly because You don't need lots of material to get started. It doesn't need to look perfect because chances are the birds aren't going to mind. They're still going to use it. In fact, I think I've made 
four birdhouses, I think, st- since I started woodworking, and all four of them have been used. Not necessarily immediately, but after a few months. Obviously, it's important to check what the guidelines are. There's a good page on the RSPB website that explains things like which orientation the birdhouse is meant to face. I think it's between north and east from memory. And what size holes to make in the front to attract certain species of birds. And also you get the satisfaction of seeing a living creature making use of something that you've made. The best materials for a project like that would be solid wood that's suitable for exterior use. But you can also just use pine or even plywood. Also, box making in general, I think, is is great practice because there's a lot of things to consider, um, like getting all of the faces flush and level, making sure that all of the corners are square, and also considering things like expansion and contraction of the timber. Yeah, I think that's a, a great first project, and I wish I'd thought of suggesting that. Um, as you say, yeah, you'd learn a lot of skills. I think there's definitely an argument in woodworking that everything you make is a box. So to start with that is a good skill. And um, as you say, if it's not perfect, it doesn't matter that much. It doesn't need to be a certain size or shape. It can really be anything. And if you've got kids, it's probably a great project as well because you can paint it and decorate it and watching it get used will be quite exciting. So I think last time you asked me about getting started and I talked about how I made a coat rack out of some pallet wood. So as that's kind of how I got started, I was just going to say that, which is a really lazy answer. It's quite a good one though, because you can make it as luxurious or as simple as you want to, depending on what kind of design you want to go for and what material you want to use. Yeah, it can be simple as a board of wood and screw some hooks to it. Also, it's practical. I like making things that then you can use and it's, it's hard to imagine how you could make a coat rack that wasn't usable at the end even if it was wonky and all the hooks were uh, (laughs) different levels it was still work and if you make something and at the end of it if you start with a chair or a table and it's totally unusable then it's quite disheartening heartening so i think starting with something that is very hard to fail at is good and it's completely bespoke as well so if you've got an alcove that's 974 millimeters wide you can make your coat rack um, just to fit nicely yes i watched your coat rack for your hallway the other day when you put the button fixings on the wrong wrong way round. yeah so that that's the most entertaining bit of the video i think the mistakes always are the most interesting part of the jobs ah especially the ones you can't work out what you've done wrong yeah i think even making like prototypes out of cardboard and things i know durest does that with some hot glue and sticks and things yeah kind of scratches that itch a bit so matt do you ever do any drawings before you get started making things I sometimes do a rough sketch, but I think I like to more make it up as I go along. As if I was making a table, say, I would probably have an idea of what size I wanted the top to be and get that made and not really think too much about the legs. And then when I've got the top done, then I'll think about the legs. So I'll break it down into stages. But I certainly don't do any computer-aided design or any modelling or anything like that. I draw a very rough idea. don't even do a cut list. I, I enjoy the making it up as I go along process. So how do you go about it? Um, I enjoy that approach too, although for the more complicated projects, sometimes I find it's useful just to draw it up on... I tend to use SketchUp nowadays... I've got a bit of background using AutoCAD from my previous employment, um, but it's a piece of software that I've never really enjoyed using, whereas SketchUp is is really intuitive, I think, and, and easy to learn, or at least I found it easy to learn anyway. And yeah, sometimes it's just nice to be able to put it down on a page to see exactly what it's going to look like, get an idea of the scale of things. And for example, if I was designing a chair, I could figure out what angle looks best for the backrest or the legs. And then take that into the workshop and know with some confidence that what's going to come out at the end is going to look halfway decent. I forgot I had a go at um, SketchUp. I remember I uh, drew a shepherd's heart in it. And from not ever using it, within like three hours I had one drawn. So actually, yeah, it's quite quick to learn. Uh, Is it still available for free? I think it is. Um, There's a version called SketchUp Make. But I think it's limited to online only. But... I believe, and this this might just be a rumour, but I'm I'm not sure how true this is at all. If you go back as far as SketchUp 8, that version can actually be used for business use 
as well as personal use for free. So that's the version that I actually still use because I'm a bit of a cheapskate. That version eight software is looking a little bit old now and it probably hasn't got half the features of the newer versions. But for me, it does everything I need it to. And until I can no longer run it, I'm going to carry on using it. Oh, well, that's really interesting. There's a free online one now. So I think that's a really good way of getting started. If you don't have many tools and things, you just want to visualize your ideas. That's a great way of doing it. And it's definitely where things are going. Being out to 3D model is going to be very useful if you ever want to get into CNC and things like that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you started your SketchUp journey with a shepherd's hut because that's quite a complicated uh, thing to map out. Yeah, well, I guess it's just a box in a way. The curved roof uh, I thought would be complicated, but actually it was really simple to draw, I remember. Once you've created the components, I thought it was interesting as well, as in if you draw a three by two, then you can keep using it over and over again. So uh, yeah, it was. I gave up after that, I have to say, because I don't enjoy doing it, but it was an interesting little exercise. I've been asked in the past whether I could make some YouTube tutorials for SketchUp and I definitely wouldn't, mainly because I've seen people try that and the videos just don't do well at all, unfortunately. But I know that Andy at Gosforth Handyman did a really good series of SketchUp videos. I think they might only be available now via his member zone platform, but that's definitely worth checking out. And another video that I often suggest for people to watch is one by Matthias Wandel, which isn't comprehensive by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a really good place to start because of how simple it is and how, from memory, I think he's basically drawing a table. And I think the best way of learning is sometimes just to jump in and do it. Um, and I think if you followed Matthias's tutorial for how to draw that table, it would give you a good understanding of the, the very basics and you can expand on it from there. Excellent. Yeah, sounds a good place to start. Obviously, other drawing softwares are available, <laughs> but I haven't tried any of them. No, neither have I, apart from Microsoft Paint. <laughs> did you do woodwork at school? I didn't, no. I don't think we even had a woodworking lesson at any point, as far as I can recall. Um, but my granddad was a carpenter, and he did lots of lathe work, lots of turning. So I was probably too young for it to rub off on me back then. But I do kind of think it's cool that I'm sort of following in his footsteps in a in a lower standard kind of way. <laughs> but I actually inherited some of his tools as well. I've got a lovely record number five hand plane from him, some old chisels. I did actually do woodwork at school for a few years. I can't remember what it was called back then, but I remember the workshop was amazing, but it was very basic. Yeah, I've also picked up a few things from my dad. He was uh, pretty handy and used to own a DIY store with a wood yard and stuff and did lots of DIY around the house. So I think, yeah, if you've got friends or family, you can pick things up from. That's really good because YouTube's useful, but it's not for everyone, is it? Not learning at first hand. And I guess there are evening classes and courses. They're always quite expensive, but I think maybe my uh, woodworking career would be different if I started by actually learning how to do things properly by someone who really knew what they were doing. So they're, they're good. And I have been tempted, but now I feel I've learned too many bad habits to go back and start again. <laughs> and I definitely have a pile of woodworking books that I use as reference as well, mainly for inspiration rather than reference, I think. So when you got to do woodworking back at school, what kind of array of tools did they have back then? I say back then as if you're really old, but... Yeah, thanks. So they had all the machinery, but that was kind of in another room and they had a technician that did all that. Uh, so it was mainly hand tools, they had cabinets full of hand tools. It was all cutting things with saws, which is a good skill to learn, which I've probably forgotten how to do it all properly. Pillar drills were something you'd use all the time, but and they had lathes, but I think that was if you did it as A-level, you got to play with them, which I didn't do. And did you feel any sort of spark for it back then? It was definitely one of my favourite lessons, but I'd, I'd never thought of it as a career. I never wanted to be a carpenter particularly. No, I never thought it would be something I continued with, I don't think. Personally, I like to learn things on my own, in my own space, in my own time. Um, and I learn by doing but I can think of one occasion where I felt I really could do with some kind of evening class or something along those lines. And that was when I bought my lathe and I really wanted to learn the basics of turning because I think it would have been really useful to actually have somebody there guiding me on what to do and what not to do. But I just happened to buy my lathe at a time when 
COVID was in full effect and uh, I couldn't actually leave the house. So in the end, I consumed many videos by Worth the Effort Woodworking, who kind of specializes in wood turning, I would say, and he's got some great videos. I learned all sorts of techniques from him. And again, I just threw myself into it and found my way through it. I did get a few nasty catches to begin with, as you can imagine. I know that a lot of people recommend starting with the carbide turning tools, but personally, having had some experience with wood and grain and chisels, for me, it always felt a little bit more natural to be using actual bowl gouges, spindle gouges, and you know, real chisels rather than the carbide tools. Have you had a go at turning yet, or is that something that you're looking to do in future? I'd love a lathe. I had a go at the Yandles Woodworking Show a couple of years ago. Richard from Brain Fizz was there, and uh, I turned a pen with him. Actually, it was a pencil, a mechanical pencil, and it was really good fun. So it's something I want to have a go. I just, um, I don't know where I'd put one at the moment, so it's when I cleared some space, I would definitely do it. I've always quite liked the idea of the, uh, I don't know if you've seen them, the foot-powered lathes. They're quite simple to make by the looks of things. Uh, I'd love to have a go on one of those one day. Yeah, the treadle treadle machines, they look great. Uh, I saw a treadle saw the other day. Also, you never need to go to the gym if you own one of these tools. Definitely keep you fit. I've also seen people do amazing things with drill-powered lathes. I think it's a video by Atomic Shrimp, who's not really a woodworker, but he just makes... He makes videos of all sorts of subjects. Um, basically anything that intrigues him, he makes videos about. But he has done a few woodworking uh, and turning projects before on his channel using literally just a drill, which is always quite impressive to me. So what about tools then, Matt? Obviously, one of the questions that we probably both get asked more than any is uh, what tools do I need to get started? Going back to that coat rack I made it was with a handsaw and a screwdriver and some very basic things that I found in the garage and those can be bought brand new really cheaply from any DIY store or something like a car boot sale or a family member probably has some in the garage they're not using we all want workshops with the uh, saw stop table saws in the center but you don't need it. it's definitely not a barrier to get started and then i think i bought a mitre saw because that's almost just like a little diy thing if you're doing a bit around the house you have an electric drill and a mitre saw is probably the next thing or a circular saw and then when i really got into woodwork in the first bit of machinery i bought was a bandsaw i would say the bandsaw is my favorite tool actually if i had one bit of machinery i'd probably have a bandsaw you could do so much on that it's a very versatile tool i think probably the real answer is if you've got a project what tools do you need to complete it and also it's a personal thing i see the argument a lot of should you get a table saw or a track saw or a band saw the right answer for one person is the wrong answer for someone else if you it depends what kind of woodworking you want to do do you want to work with sheet goods or reclaimed materials or solid wood or so it's really picking your tools for your project i'd say yeah, exactly right. If you really want to get started making something, decide on what you want to make to begin with and then figure out what tools you need from there. And some people are probably going to want to go down the hand tool route while others are going to want to go down the power tool route. Personally, I use a mixture of both. I tend to choose whatever is going to get the job done best and quickest. So hand tools like chisels and hand planes I use all the time because they're great tools for particular jobs, whereas I tend not to use hand saws very often because I can often get better and quicker results using power tools. I can cut a reasonably straight line with a hand saw, but I can make that cut much better with a power tool. Having said that, there are situations where using a hand saw, coping saw, hacksaw, whatever it might be, is the better tool for the job. Yeah, it's nice and we're going to show off because after doing this for years, we've got a workshop full of things and we have... We have all those saws and the powered versions of them. But we didn't start like that. It was a gradual thing of building up over years, wasn't it? It's not, oh, I'm going to be a woodworker. I'm going to go and spend £10,000 on tools. It was very much start small and add things over time. Yep, absolutely. I mean, the first tools that I had were a cordless drill, a hand saw, a few screwdrivers that I think I pinched from my dad's toolbox. I think that's it. I, I, and I made quite a lot of things just using those tools alone. And they weren't great, but they were good enough to get me started. And, and I enjoyed it. What was the first bit of machinery you bought? 
I remember buying a belt sander and that was, I think, the first tool that I bought that was a power tool other than the cordless drill. And I mainly bought that because I could use it to clean up rough timber and rough timber was all I had to work with. So it was quite a useful tool for that. After that, I think I got a circular saw and I ended up turning that circular saw into a table saw because I'd seen so many people using a table saw on YouTube, but I didn't want to buy one because I couldn't afford it and I had nowhere to put it at the time. So I did the classic upside down circular saw through a sheet of plywood with a makeshift fence and uh, it's probably not something that I would recommend that other people do because there are obviously a lot of safety implications. But for me, it did the job at the time. How about you? What were the first um, What were the first power tools that you bought? Well, I think I always had drills because they were almost just a household toolkit item. And then I think really I went to bits of machinery rather than had. I mean, it took me ages to get a circular saw. I had a band saw and a table saw before that. Uh, just because I've been lucky, I think working in pubs they always have outbuildings well not always all the ones i did so i kind of had a workshop which means you can have machinery as if you don't and you work in your garden you tend to have more handheld stuff but the bandsaw yeah i bought the record power one which was definitely more expensive than a lot of them but um it lasted me like five years and did really well yeah i've always done well buying used machines as well and uh, when i've upgraded i've managed to sell them on for what i paid for them or more even yeah, you don't really lose much money with, with, with machinery, do you? No, I think if you want to get started, though, car boot sales are amazing for tools, especially hand tools. You can pick them up so cheaply. Sometimes they're a bit rusty and they need a bit of clean up, but I quite enjoy that. Yeah, me too. Facebook Marketplace as well. Some amazing deals to be had there. Yeah, Facebook Marketplace is great for tools and it's also great for wood, but maybe we'll leave that for another episode eBay is also really good for picking up things like secondhand hand planes, old Stanleys and record planes. You do pay a bit of a premium, I think, on there. So you might pay 25 to 30 pounds for a Stanley number four hand plane. Whereas if you go to a car boot sale, you could probably get that for £2.50 to £5. Seems to be the going rate from what I've seen. But saying that, still spending 25 to £30 on a hand plane on eBay definitely isn't being ripped off because these these are tools that last forever and work fantastically well once they're well set up and antique shops too there are a few antique shops locally to me where you can get vintage hand tools at really reasonable prices Um, so don't necessarily let the word antique put you off if you go in and explore these places you'll often find lots and lots of old hand planes chisels stuff like that because they're in such big supply There are so many good quality chisels out there, um, but you can pick them up for £2.50 and you're probably going to get better value buying vintage chisels individually when compared with buying a cheaper new set. Yes, and a lot of people would argue the old ones are better quality as well. Yeah, I think that probably is true, but I've got to say my cheap-ish set of Stanley chisels that I've had for years, those tend to hold their edge pretty well in my experience. I know Paul Sellers, he raves about, is it the Audi ones? Yeah. Like six pounds a set or something. Definitely don't let the cost of tools put you off. You can get some really good things cheaply. Those are the Audi ones with the wooden handles, weren't they? Yes, I think they stopped making them, he said. But oh. The thing is, you could spend very little money on chisels or you could spend a hell of a lot. But when it comes to preparing the edge and flattening the back of the chisel... You could spend just as much time trying to get the hollow out of an expensive chisel as a cheaper one. Yeah, and it's a good skill to learn. And if you've got a bit more money to spend, there's a really good set by Narex as well, a set of chisels that I've had my eye on for years. I think from memory, they're about 40 to 50 pounds for a set of five chisels, but they are really well regarded. Whether I could tell the difference between those and my Stanley ones, though, I'm not entirely sure. And I think that's what's always held me back on, uh, on going to buy them. Yeah, I've seen those. They've got nice wooden handles. I've got a reasonably cheap set of Irwin ones, and they seem really quite good. I think I paid something like £17 for a set of five, and they needed a bit of work, but they're really quite good. You have to do more work. I think if you buy like the Lee Nielsen ones, they're going to come almost ready to use. But I think it's important to learn how to sharpen them, so get the cheap ones. Maybe spend the money you save on that diamond stone I think you did a video on. I much prefer the diamond stones to wet stones because they're always going to be flat. And I would definitely, that's what I'd go for. 
Although personally, I really like the wet stones as well, just because they tend to cut much quicker than diamond stones from my experience. So I really like the combination of having a diamond stone with a relatively low grit, somewhere around 300 or thereabouts, and a wet stone with a higher grit. I think mine from memory is 1000 and 6000 because it's double sided because you can then use the diamond stone to flatten the wet stone. So you can get the wet stone perfectly flat and then cut through the steel really quickly to get a nice fresh edge. Mm, that's a good system. Have you ever used a sharpening system? I think you've got like a grinder to do your gouges. Do you ever do other tools on that? I do tend to use it for my, um, I know everyone has their inferior chisels that get used for all sorts of tasks that they shouldn't be used for. I do usually tend to the grinder just to put a clean edge on the, the rubbish chisels that I use. I don't tend to use them for my best chisels though. I think I get a little bit precious about keeping the, the nice chisels in relatively good shape. But the thing with chisels is I tend to find myself using the same size over and over again and it's usually the half inch one and the three quarter inch one or 12 mil and 18 mil I should say. I very rarely use the 25 mil one inch one and I very rarely use the six mil quarter inch one either. Yeah I think I've got a one and a half inch one because I saw it I think it was a Marples and I saw it at a car boot sale for two pounds and I had to have it but I've never used it. <laughs> I do quite fancy having a proper sharpening system though either one of these abrasive belt ones then obviously you've got a flat surface which is easy to get the angle or one of these wet stones ones but both systems are very expensive yeah i've i've considered getting one as well but i quite like the idea of trying to develop the kind of muscle memory of sharpening by hand just so that once you've sort of acquired that skill and i'm not saying i'm in any way highly proficient at it but i can sharpen a chisel by hand and if i carry on doing it that way for the next five years i know i will be reasonably good at it but the appeal of having a machine there that makes it really quick and almost immediate to get a perfectly sharp edge definitely is appealing yeah i guess if you're turning all the time you're constantly sharpening do we need to talk more about books I don't really look at books. I've got one of those um, Dorking Kingly woodworking ones. It's got it's got all the joints in with pictures step by step. It's quite good. But I'm more into like books about furniture, as in I just bought one about shaker style furniture. It's, it's not about how to make it. It's just pictures of pieces, and I'm using that more for inspiration. That's a good idea. Yeah. Whenever I'm in a secondhand bookshop, I always look at the furniture books but it's kind of redundant now with pinterest and things you can find any image you need online a shame but i don't know sometimes i sit down with a pile of books and flick through them and it uh, somehow is more pleasant than sat on the computer yeah it's a really good point about inspiration um sometimes i just go to sort of antique shops or secondhand furniture shops just to look at how things are shaped how things are designed how the joinery is done and that often leads to some ideas yes like i saw that magazine rack on uh, instagram today and i just thought that was really cool the one you sent me a photo of so that was like a almost like a cat or a dog shaped magazine rack yeah there was quite a lot of bent lamination in it so if somebody wanted to get started woodworking and they wanted to go down the power tool route, what three tools do you think would be your essential recommendations? I'm going to assume they have a drill driver because, yeah. Is this, is this a way of getting four tools? Rather yeah, than three? I, I'm already <laughs> bending the rules. <laughs> then I'd say you've got to have a saw, so a circular saw. Uh, for straight cuts, a jigsaw for curved cuts, and then I'd go for a random orbital sander. Yeah, I think those would be my picks as well. Um, you can obviously do straight cuts with a jigsaw alone if you've got a straight edge guiding the blade, but it's so slow. <laughs> yeah, it's so slow and it's not a nice cut, especially if you if you wanted to cut sheet goods down, that's going to be a tedious job. Yeah, and I remember back when I got my first circular saw, I found them really quite awkward to get used to using. Now, that might have been because... It was a £30 circular saw from Argos, so it wasn't necessarily the most finessed of tools. But I think there's a reason why they call it a skill saw, because I think it does require some skill to, to be able to use a circular saw effectively. And that's something that just comes with a lot of practice, I think. I might go back and change my mind already, because they're so cheap now, and swap the circular saw for a plunge saw. With a plunge saw and a jigsaw, you could do most most things. But having that straight edge, and actually they've got um, 
something in between now you can get circular saws that run on tracks so then you can really do both things but um i'm a big big fan of the track saw yeah me too but before i got one i was able to do everything i needed to do with a circular saw it's just that ultimate convenience of having a track saw yes and there's things the track saw can't do well it probably can but it's not as good if you wanted to cross cut some construction lumber to build a shed it's not a good tool for that as the circular saw is but then you could use the jigsaw yeah that's true or a handsaw (laughs) or a handsaw yeah or we could add a fifth tool (laughs) and the one hand tool i don't want to use is sanding I, i could i could drill by hand and put screws in with a screwdriver but the random orbital sander just saves so much time and all the dust gets sucked up Although it doesn't, does it? Because you haven't got a vacuum extractor yet. <laughs> well, you could nick the one out of the house. Have you ever used a conventional household vacuum cleaner for extraction? I've certainly used a Henry Hoover. They work really well. The next tool to get after all those is a vacuum because you can get them so cheaply now. Dust extraction is such a massive thing and it's so important. Maybe we should have a whole episode on that one day. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. And it's I found it the most complicated subject as in this whole low pressure, high volume and high pressure, low volume. What's the difference and why can't one be used for the other? Until you got them and really understood. I tried all the ducting first and then realised I didn't like it. And yeah, it's it's a really complicated system. Someone moaned at me on Instagram the other day because I was wearing too much PPE. (laughs) What a thing to moan about. Was that just an image that you'd posted? Yeah, I had respirator, ear defenders and glasses on. How dare you? <laughs> yeah, they, they said, where's your hard hat? And I was like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, well, you've got everything else on. I'm like, yeah, I am. Well, I'm using a power tool. I don't want to damage my lungs, my eyes or my hearing. How unreasonable of me. <laughs> I've got the JPS, I think it is. JSP. JSP. Yeah. I like it because you, you pinch the filters and it closes them. And then, especially if you've got a mirror, you can then breathe and see the mask implode. So you know you've got a perfect seal. Wow. So if you've got facial hair, it's really important because I sometimes do it and I close the filters and I can still breathe because it's not sealing properly. And then I know to adjust the straps or have a shave. Yeah. Might have to buy one of those because they're not particularly expensive either. I think like tool station, they're about 20 quid. Mm. Obviously, another big factor in getting started is having a place to work. Um, where did you do your early days of woodworking? I had an outbuilding in a broken chest freezer that uh, I kind of used as a workbench. So not perfect, but yeah, I, I guess you, I've done a lot of things in the garden. An old Black & Decker workmate that you get from a, a car boot sale for a fiver is quite good. And then you can pack it up and put it away. Having a shed or something's good. But yeah, obviously progressing to a custom built workshop is the dream. But a big investment in space and money and is definitely not an option for everyone. You started working outside, did you? I think when I think back to when I first started woodworking, I was living in flats. So the first flat that I was living in at the time when I first started actually getting into woodworking was a maisonette on the first floor. So there was no balcony that I could use or anything like that. So everything I made, I made indoors, either in the kitchen or in my bedroom. Later on, I lived in another flat which had a little bit of a courtyard outside. So that was really nice to be able to go out and use that space. But that was a shared space and uh, I didn't really like being overseen by my neighbour all the time. So more often than not, I would drag projects back into the kitchen and, and start working indoors again. I heard you say that you donated some tools to your local men's sheds as well. The guys that I met there were were, were brilliant. Um, I didn't spend a great deal of time there. But they've got a huge network, I think, and uh, pretty much most towns have one. So it's a great place to go and uh, do projects with people and learn from other people and uh, a, a nice place to work, I imagine. I know that Peter from The Small Shed um, on YouTube, he does a lot of work in men's sheds and from time to time people will come to the men's shed and ask for a particular thing to be made i think the latest one i saw peter do was a little hedgehog house just from some random junk that this person had basically donated to the men's shed i think it was a roof tile and a few bits of plywood from memory i don't know what their um policy is with the women i don't know if they're allowed in that's true actually yeah 
But if not, I guess there's maker spaces, which I've had a tour of a couple, and the ones I've seen have amazing facilities. And you obviously get some training on all the machines so everyone's safe, and uh, you can just rent a bench by the hour or the day and uh, make something. But I think they're few and further between. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm not aware of any around around my area. Well, how did you go about finding out where they were? Well, I've had a friend whose sister actually had a business startup in London. So they were renting an archway under the Thames from this makerspace. And it's under Somerset House, but on the banks of the Thames in the basement. And they just had everything, full-size CNCs amazing full panel saws a room full of uh, industrial sewing machines 3d printers everything you could possibly think of and to be a member it was 300 pounds a month or something so quite a lot of money but these were mostly people actually with small businesses so for a central london address and all access to all this equipment that was pretty cheap do you know if there are any in your neck of the woods now i have no idea it's just not something I've looked into because I've got plenty of space now and all the machines I need, really. If you live in a city in a flat and there's one that you can go to, that'd be fantastic. I find it quite hard sometimes to get motivated to get started. But if someone's asked me to make something for them, that I find hugely motivating because now someone's relying on me or going to be chasing me, then I will get it done. But also, I think necessity the fact that if I haven't got a bedside table and I hate reaching down on the floor to get my glass of water, then I'm going to build one. I kind of prioritise projects that I feel are necessary or been asked for rather than things that maybe I'd like to make at some point in the future. They keep getting put off. Yeah, I find that too, actually. I think I've got a list of projects that I want to get around to doing and it's been sort of expanding and expanding for a few years now but part of me knows that I'll never tick every project off that list. I tend to just work on whatever is the most exciting thing to me at the time unless like you say somebody else has asked for something because then you also get the satisfaction of making something for somebody else and and hopefully pleasing that person hopefully. Christmas and birthdays as well if you're a a woodworker I guess this turning would be a particularly good one because how are you going to get rid of all the stuff you turn you can't have your house full of it if you can give pieces away to friends and family for Christmas and birthdays that's that's a great way of uh, motivating you to go and make something yeah I think wood turning is is a particularly good skill to have for gift making because you can just quickly churn out many bowls spinning tops for children all sorts of stuff you could probably make five or six bowls in a day whereas anything furniture related i mean i don't know what the average is for you but anything that i make tends to take between two and three days yeah absolutely this might be another episode in the future is making money from your hobby but i can see how turning could be monetized much easier than furniture making so i know what i'm getting for christmas then (laughs) Have you seen anything on YouTube that's piqued your interest over the past couple of weeks? I forgot we did that. I've got one, so I'm happy to start if you want to have a look through your phone. (laughs) So yeah, the video I saw was a recent one by Pask Makes. I don't know if you saw it, um, where he basically drilled holes in irregular shapes to form a pattern. The video was called Any Shaped Holes with a Regular Drill. How? And basically he recreates this, what I believe is quite an old technique by creating two pronged cutters using some steel, loads them into the drill, makes a template, and then uses those cutters to basically form that shape. I was just watching it thinking, there's no way this is going to work. I can't see how this could possibly work. But I guess the, is it called centrifugal force? Where where the two things splay out when when it's spinning i guess that's how it works but yeah as i say when i was watching it i was thinking how on earth is this going to work and then completely proved me wrong but pask makes is just one of those channels that you can rely on for ideas that you might not have seen before and innovation and for me they're two things that i've really looked for in woodworking videos nowadays having consumed so much over the past six years yeah you're right i've not seen this one yet but everything he does is top notch so i would definitely go and check that out after this i enjoyed one by uh, david pursuto of make something and the title was i turn rotten wood into art so i'm very interested in you know doing more artistic things and this is just a log he picked up 
that was rotten in the center and he carves it away using one of those Arbitec carving discs and then fills it with some epoxy and he just he welds up a little stand for it and I think it looks fantastic and it's yeah I, I definitely want to have a go at more stuff like that I haven't seen that one yet either I think that's in my watch later list so I look forward to watching that one we could do a nice cheesy wrap up with the uh, now we've described ways of getting started get out there and make something <laughs> You can find me on YouTube by searching for Badger Workshop and find Keith by searching for Rag and Bone Brown. You can also find links to our channels in the show notes. We also have an Instagram and Facebook page for the Workshop Banter podcast. Both can be found at Workshop Banter, all one word, and we'll leave links to these in the show notes as well. You can also email us at workshopbanter at gmail.com. We'd love to hear any feedback and let us know if there's anything you'd like us to talk about in the future. We're also keen to hear any questions you might have, work-related or otherwise. So thanks for listening.